So this is our last week in a series uh, at the end of Romans chapter 12, and we've been talking a lot about conflict and forgiveness and all of those things, and somebody said, one more week? I don't know. I don't know if I can handle that. Somebody else told me, no, it's really a good thing that we did this just before Thanksgiving when we got together with all of our family, because there were several opportunities when I decided not to say something when it would have been a big mess, and I said I was all prepped and ready, so we are ready. So now we are after Thanksgiving, so we're going to be talking about forgiveness again. And, uh, and the idea is that God wants us to be dramatically different in the way that we love other people than the people who are in the world. So open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to take a moment to walk through that. The message this weekend is called The Care and Feeding of Enemies. Somebody said, well, maybe we already did that at Thanksgiving. That could have been a possibility. But (laughs) the way that God calls us to treat our enemies is absolutely diametrically different than our sinful nature. I remember the first time when I got really, really angry with somebody. Uh, We lived in Utah, and I was in the junior high, and there were several brothers below me and a couple of neighbor kids, and we had this great adventure. We were going to build a cave. And so we dug a hole in the ground, and it, was a, it went down about six or seven feet straight down, and then it, it went in a kind of a diagonal down deeper, and then we were back into the hill. Actually, it was flat. We were back into the ground, probably a good 10 foot, and we were carrying the dirt out in buckets, and we were setting up reflective mirrors so we could get the sunlight down there. Um, maybe this is the first time my parents are hearing about this. I didn't realize that. <laughs> But it was our grand adventure. We thought it was so fun. And we went out there one day, and somebody had taken a shovel and caved it all in. And I'm not sure where we got the story, but we heard it was our neighbor, Banaski. (laughs) And we heard he was drunk, and since he was a Mormon elder, I don't know if he was drunk or not, but (laughs) he caved it in because he thought it was dangerous. And oh, we were so mad. We talked about that big carport he had next to our house. We were going to cut through the supports on that and have it collapse on his head and then tell him it was dangerous. (laughs) We actually never did anything, but I was a part of the fellowship of revenge. You ever been part of that fellowship? Like to talk about what you'd like to say to them, what you'd like to do to them, And maybe it's a conversation you only have in the shower in your head. But it is a deep and common poison that not only paralyzes our hearts, it kills the spirit within us. It grieves the spirit within us. And God has a dramatically different plan of how he wants us to respond to Mr. Benaski, (laughs) whoever your Mr. Benaski might be. And in Romans chapter 12, he he starts at the beginning of the chapter with, in view of God's mercy, all of his love, all of his goodness to us, I want you to surrender your lives. I want you to live in a way different than the world around you. I want you to live a God-honoring, Christ-centered life. And so now he gets really specific. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, 12.1 says, in view of God's mercy, the essence of the idea of mercy is that you don't give somebody what they deserve. So God is asking us to live in mercy. You know, most of the time when you're thinking revenge, you are very clear that it's well-deserved. God says, I don't want you to live like that. But the idea of grace is that instead of not getting what we deserve negatively, it means that instead of that, God has given us his love and has invited us into his family and he's forgiven our sin. And instead of the punishment that we deserve, he's given us so many positive, wonderful blessings. And so he asks us to extend grace. Because he goes on and he says, on the contrary, as opposed to your natural inclination, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. 
Some of you think that burning coals part is the only part of this verse that you like. (laughs) Bam, there we go. Because our natural inclination is vengeance. And I want you to notice that, that critical difference there. He says, I want you to overcome revenge. If we're going to become more like Christ, you are going to be tempted regularly to be angry and bitter. And you know, I joke about Mr. Banaski caving in our cave. But as I talk with people, as a pastor, I see the best and the worst of the life of the world. But I hear stories of violence and abuse, of lying, of being stolen from, of, of people whose lives have been deeply and dramatically altered by either the ignorance or even sometimes by the maliciousness of other people. And I know as soon as we start talking about forgiveness, for many of you, there's a red light that comes on on your dashboard of somebody that hurts you deeply, maybe when you were a child, maybe in business, maybe in your family. And you're thinking, I have never done anything, but every time I think of it, there's a hot hatred in me that comes up. And God says, I want you to overcome revenge, and I am here to tell you that you can't afford to hate the people you hate, but I'm also here to tell you, you do not have the power by yourself to forgive them. It is natural to want vengeance. It is supernatural to be able to live in forgiveness and in harmony and in peace. And there's a key difference in the wording here. He says, do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath because God says it's mine to avenge. Now, those words are very similar, avenge and revenge, but there's a distinct difference. Avenge is with the idea of justice being brought that a courtroom is to avenge that which is wrong, that which is criminal, that which deserves punishment. That's avenge. Revenge is all about payback. It's all about retaliation. It's personal. It's really, we don't really care that much about justice. In fact, if you understand the Old Testament law that said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that was really to keep people from doing more. Because think about it, if somebody took your eye out, you'd want to take both theirs and all of their children's. There's that desire in us to do more because it's personal. And God says, it's my job to avenge, so I don't want you getting in my lane. It's my job to take care of that, and therefore, don't play God. When you try to take retaliation, when you allow that bitterness to build inside of you, when you want to be the judge, jury, and executioner, God says, you are not leaving room. You're not trusting God to do God's things. You're trying to take it on yourself. Now, you don't think of it like that, but God's saying, this is what really happens, is you are getting into my lane, and because of that, it's kind of interesting. It sounds like, he says, I want you to leave room for God's wrath. I never really thought about this, but if you are focused on vengeance, it sounds like God's not going to step in and do justice because you're not leaving room. I I think of it like God's trying to line up and and he's bringing justice and you're in the road and he can't even take a shot. So he says, first of all, you need to understand the mercy that you are not to let vengeance overwhelm you. You are not to let it take over your heart. You are not to let it control you. God has a different plan. He says, I want you actually, when your enemy's hungry, when he has a need, when he's destitute, I want you to be that kindness that says, here, have some food. Here, have some drink. And he says, in doing so, it'll bring burning coals on his head. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But first of all, look at that idea of what God wants us to do. And then I think the question follows, who are my enemies? And I'm afraid that we sometimes think of enemies only as people who've done criminal acts or something super villain-like, the terrible things. <laughs> and we say, okay, God, I know you want me to forgive them. But there's a whole bunch of people in your life that are just plain jerks. You know, they, they, haven't, 
they haven't gotten to the level of enemy. You think of them as just, they're just mean, they're just ignoring you, they're just selfish, whatever word you want to put in there. And I asked a guy who was really having struggle with his neighbor, and he was talking about him, and, and the Spirit prompted me one day as we were talking through it, and I said, do you think he's your enemy? And there was this moment of, well, I guess so. You see, let me define enemy for you. The word enemy is Latin word. It says, in amicus, which is not my friend. Your enemy is somebody that's against you or somebody that you're against. That makes it simple, doesn't it? So it doesn't have to be a supervillain. God says, all the people in your life that are against you at whatever level, I want you to give mercy, don't get caught in vengeance, and I want you to give grace. I want you to give them something out of kindness. Who are my enemies? Could be somebody that you work with. Could be somebody that took advantage of you years ago. Could be an ex-spouse. Could be your children. Could be your parents. Somebody who's against you for whatever reason, even temporarily. And the interesting part is when I said to this man, is this your enemy? He said, yeah, I think he is. And it's like, oh good, now we know what to do. Because the Bible's really clear about how to treat your enemies. You're to pray for those. You're to bless those who curse you. Jesus said if they strike you on one cheek, what are you supposed to do? Sue them for all they're worth. <laughs> you see, we think revenge so fast, don't we? But he says, no, I want you to turn the other. If they force you to go one mile as the Roman soldier could compel anyone to carry his bag for a mile. He says, I want you to double it. Go, go with them too. You see, God's plan all the way through this passage, and this is the theme of the whole thing, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, when people irritate us, when people are unkind to us, even when people abuse us, that may be sin on their part, but it's not a sin to be hurt myself. But when I start thinking about how I hate them or how I would like to tell them off or what I'd like to do or, or when I take an attitude of revenge, then it becomes sin in me. And then it begins to infect my soul. And so God says, I want to free you from that. I want you to love your enemies. You see, I think sometimes we boil down the message of the gospel into, let's be really nice. Just behave yourselves. Be kind. And that's not the message of the gospel. The, the message of the gospel is to show the radical kind of love that God has shown to us. And it is not easy. In fact, it's impossible without the Spirit of God working in us. And so God has to do a deeper work in our heart. He has to work past our desire for revenge and help us to overcome resentment. That, that tendency in us to not maybe react, but just to resent and eventually, if you allow resentment to build, it will come out in your words and your actions. And so he says, I want to do a deep cleaning in you. And I, I like this picture of a log jam because I think this is what happens in many relationships. It's certainly what happens in a lot of marriages. It's what happens in a lot of families. Is there's an offense or a fight or a conflict or a difficulty, and it never gets solved. And when you get one big log across the river, what happens to everything else that comes down the stream? Yeah, and so you look at a relationship and you think there's no hope for that. It's absolutely too complex, too many things gone wrong. And the beauty of it is that if God will direct you to make right the very beginning of the problem, what I find is a lot of the logs go on down the stream. There's a lot of things you can let go once you're freed from that bitterness and that resentment. Because once somebody has hurt you and once you are resentful of them, they can't do anything right. Because we, we see them through that lens. And God says, I want you to be involved in the process of forgiveness. And last week, Pastor Jason walked us in a very powerful message through his own experience of forgiveness and his own experience of confession. And God wants us to make a choice to forgive. And again, God is asking you to allow him to work in you to give you that desire to forgive. And we have a hundred excuses why we shouldn't forgive. They don't deserve it is usually the first one. And then you start applying that. Well, God forgave you. Did you deserve it? 
In fact, I was thinking, we're walking through Romans. Romans chapter 5, he says, while we were still enemies, Christ, what? Died for us. Wow. So he's not asking us to do anything that he's not already done and that he doesn't want to give us power to do. And then there's the process of forgiving. Because it's ridiculous to think, especially a major hurt, that you can make one decision and forgive and it's all gone. No, it'll come up again. And there's something very helpful I found in that book called Peacemaker that I told you about. And it's a process of how do we do this forgiving. And realize that your choice to forgive says four promises. I won't dwell on the offense. Will that hurt come back into your mind again? Yeah. Oh, yeah, just like that. Something will trigger it, and you'll, you'll be thinking about that. And you say, by the power of the Spirit, I'm going to make that thought subject to Jesus. Every thought captive, including my angry thoughts. I won't throw it in your face. When we get fighting, I won't get historical on you. I won't bring back that up. Isn't it amazing how that happens? You haven't had a fight for two months, and all of a sudden, little thing triggers it, and you go back and you research everything, and you don't even have to think about it. It comes to your mind with perfect detail. Well, at least one half of it. I love it when people tell me about a conflict. They said, and they said this, and they said this, and they said this. And then I said a couple things I probably shouldn't have said. It's like, wow, we have such a tendency to emphasize what other people have done. I'm not going to throw it in your face. I won't gossip to others about it. You see, that's the source of a lot of gossip. Because I'm resentful and I'm fearful. I'm mad at you, but I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm not going to confess or ask you to tell me what it is that you did. But I'm just going to tell everybody else. And that's why that sin is so prevalent in all of us. And then the last one says, I won't let it hinder our relationship. That I won't let that become an impediment to us moving forward. And let me say carefully, because this is the tricky one. Let me talk to two groups of you. There are some people who can find an excuse not to forgive about anything. And, and I am very concerned about the level of abuse in our homes and in our culture. But I also am concerned with the fact that abuse gets thrown around everywhere. It gets to be the excuse for why marriages are breaking up. And sometimes you dig into it and it's like, I'm not sure that was abuse. I think that was just normal marital conflict. But for many of us, our greatest tendency is to find reasons why we should cut people off. There are so many people that say, well, that branch of the family we don't talk to anymore. I got neighbors on both sides of me, haven't talked to them in 10 years. We cut people off. Instead of saying, God is desiring us to bring peace, to bring shalom. Shalom means the putting back together what's broken, the, the making whole of that which is partial. So for many of us, that's a tough promise is we've got to say, I'm going to learn to trust you again. I'm going to rebuild the bridge. I'm going to absolutely forgive you and not let it hinder our relationships. The other side, and that is there are some people that keep going back into situations that are dangerous and harmful, and there are some situations in which it is not wise to enter back into a close relationship with them. They have not repented, they're still doing the same things, and it's dangerous. So there is a possibility for that, and I just mentioned that. Some people seem to keep going back in, and in when there's been no change. And the scripture clearly talks about speaking the truth in love and making clear that if there's a wrong that's been done, it's addressed. And if it's an illegal thing, it's been reported. And these things are, there's a safeguard to be taken care of. But even then, listen to me, even if somebody has done a criminal act against you, you can't afford to resent them because it will, it will permeate and infect your spirit. You have to let it go. And that's what God says here. It's my job to avenge. So what do you do? You release those people to God. Say, God, you take care of them as you see fit. And you know, we wish it were immediate, don't we? There's something satisfying when we read the story in the New Testament of Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit and they dropped dead. And I think that's a good idea until I'm afraid it might be me. But we need to leave room for God's wrath, he says. And then there's this process that goes on and he says, then at some point you will find that you have forgiven, that it's complete, that it has been worked through and there's no longer any heat to it. 
There's no longer any anger boiling up within you. And that is a work of grace and a work of God. And then he makes this last enigmatic statement. He says, if you will do this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. This is a quote from the book of Proverbs. So God's idea of grace is not new. But at the book of Proverbs, it's interesting. It says, there's a last line on it. It says, and God will reward you. And I'm sure his hearers knew that. But he says you will heap burning coals on his head. So I've done a lot of research. We had a lot of discussion about it this week because it's a hard phrase to understand. But let me explain to you what I think is the best understanding of it. When you and I are having a conflict and you do something and I do something, you always start it. You remember that? You started it and, <laughs> and I escalate it and then you do something and I say something and things escalate. Your conflict is held in place by the fact that you're both blaming each other. So when there are two people blaming each other, we never have to take responsibility for ourselves. We're just looking at what that other person did. But what happens when that other person humbly comes, apologizes, asks for forgiveness, gives you food when you're hungry, gives you water when you're thirsty? It's pretty hard to blame somebody who's doing it right. So when you quit blaming him, what are you left with? Your own shame, your own conscience, your own conviction. And I believe that that's the first part of this, is that if we respond with forgiveness and kindness and letting go of resentment, then the Spirit of God is free to bring the full weight of conviction on them. And that that can be like something that burns within them that brings them, hopefully, to repentance. Our desire should not be that they get their head burned off. <laughs> if God has healed the resentment in you, your desire that your enemy would no longer be victims of the enemy, that they would be set free, that they might find God, that they might find forgiveness, that they might find change. And I think there's a hint there also. If they don't respond to God's discipline, then someday there will be an eternal torment that is part of God's absolute and complete justice. Let me tell you a story that's scary and powerful and also a picture of what happens if we don't respond to God. If the burning coals, instead of becoming a part of forgiveness, they become a part of our relationship. There was a, a woman named Daisy. Her dad was a mean drunk. He would come home drunk and he would yell and scream and she watched him kick her younger brothers across the floor. He was abusive in every sense of the word. And as she grew up, he eventually kicked her mom out of the home. She went down the street with her suitcase. It was a home full of anger and bitterness. And most of the kids moved out and went to live with other relatives. And Daisy was left with her dad. And as soon as she got out of the home, she couldn't wait to be away from that man. And she said, I will never be like that man, and I will never talk to him the rest of my life. Daisy's dad was so low on the drunk scale, he ended up in the gutter. And finally, one night, he went to a Salvation Army mission. And you know, you had to go to the service before you had supper. So he went to the church service, and they gave an altar call and asked people to come forward and surrender their life to Christ. And he thought it was only proper for him to do that, even though he didn't know if he really meant it. And he got up there, and God did a work in his heart, and God changed his heart, and he really gave his life to Christ. And from that moment, his life began to change, and he became sober, and then he began to ask forgiveness of each of his children, and he said, there's nothing I can do to take away what I've done, but I want you to forgive me if you can. And every one of his children forgave him except Daisy. And Daisy said, I would never forgive you. And dad's health was shot from all the years of drinking, and eventually he went to live with one of his kids, and he lived eight doors down from Daisy. And she walked by every morning to go to work, and she walked by every evening on the way home from work, and she never went to see her dad, even when he was dying. But she allowed her kids to go see him, and Margaret went down to see him one day, and he was on his last legs, and she walked in the door, and he, in his confusion, thought it was Daisy. And he said, Daisy, you finally come. And he was hallucinating what grace can do. But Daisy never went. And Daisy 
said she was never going to be like her dad and she never touched a drop of alcohol. But she became a mean, angry mother. She screamed at her kids. She said, why did I ever have you? You've ruined my life. And her son Michael grew up in the 60s and he got involved in drugs and the hippie scene and she wrote him off and she said, I will never talk to you again. And when the book was written, Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he said it's been 26 years and she's never talked to him since. See, that's the power of bitterness and resentment and of hatred. That the crimes of her father became the shape of her life. And Jesus says, I want you to release your enemies. Make room for God's wrath. Give them over to him and allow God to bring healing and peace, joy. Allow God to do a supernatural work in you. And I think even the world agrees with us that forgiveness is better than revenge. But without Christ, there's no power to do it. It's a great idea, but we can't do it on our own. I was reading a devotional in the YouVersion Bible, and it's called The Grudge. Isn't that a great picture? When you hold a grudge, you're hanging on to a cactus. And you know what? It keeps poking you. And you know what? It also keeps you from hugging anybody. It separates you from other people. It perpetuates the cycle. There's a great statement they use in the 12-step programs. They said, if you keep resenting somebody who's hurt you, you are allowing them to rent space in your head. And they never pay the rent. You see, God's plan is to set us free, to get us past the grudges and the hurts of our past. And I don't know who you're thinking about as we're talking about this, but God has been working in our congregation. A number of people have told me that, that God has moved them to write a letter, to call somebody, to make a contact. And one of the tough ones that I know comes up repeatedly is some of you have gone through messy and painful divorces. And when you think of somebody who's an enemy, you would think of your ex-spouse, and especially over the years as it often gets exacerbated by conflicts over vacation time with the kids and holidays and all of those things. And we have a new ministry that's a part of our equip classes in the spring, and this is a class that's going to be here at the Sutherland campus, and if you're from Green or South County, you're more than welcome to come. But for the first time, we are able to offer a group that's specifically designed to help people who have been through that terrible, painful experience of divorce. To know how to respond and re deal with the hurts and the resentment within you. But it's also about how do we live single? How do we prepare our lives? How do we honor God in this situation we're in? And there's some wonderful people that have stepped forward to be part of that. And if you are in that story, or if you know somebody who is, maybe you can be part of helping bring freedom, peace, hope to somebody who's in a tough place, because that's a tough place. You see, God wants us as people who are followers of him. The end of this passage in Romans chapter 12 is he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, it's not enough just to not get caught in bitterness and resentment and anger and not let it paralyze and infect your spirit. He says, I want you to help other people. I want you to love your enemies in hopes that God would grant them repentance leading to life. In hope that God would be able to change their hearts, would be able to bring renewed relationship if even if possible. And so I think we need to beware of the infection. And there's a primary infection, which is what I've been talking about when somebody hurts you. I also want to warn you about secondary trauma. Secondary trauma is the word they give it if somebody's involved in, in a terrible shooting or a terrible domestic issue, they have first level trauma. But sometimes people who are coming in to help them, the firefighters or the policemen or counselors, they, they end up with secondary trauma because they're involved with somebody who's been traumatized. And I think that happens sometimes when we are trying to help others. Listen carefully. Getting over an offense that somebody has done to you is one level. But it's easy for us to hold on to offenses for what somebody has done to my friend or what somebody did to my child or what somebody did to my parent. That's the secondhand side of it. 
And here's what I've noticed, is that two people can have a conflict. Maybe they're work partners, and they have a conflict, and they both go home, and they pour out to their spouses what an idiot this person is, and how bad it was, and what they said. And then they go back, and maybe they come to terms, and they work out their differences, and they forgive each other. What have you left with your spouses at home to deal with? They don't have the chance for that to be resolved. They don't have the chance for that to be healed. It's easy for us to get angry for other people and to not have the grace to forgive somebody who's even hurt somebody else. It particularly, I think, is one of the reasons that Paul writes this in Galatians. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, in this case, hatred and resentment and hurt, you who live by the Spirit should restore the person gently, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. That you may get caught in that same cycle of hating and resentment and divorce. So he not only says, don't be overcome by evil, but he says, overcome evil with good. I'm here to tell you that love is the most powerful force in the universe and that God can use us to bring love to situations where there is no love. God can use us to bring peace where there are situations where peace is not there. There's a difference between a peace enjoyer and a peacemaker. A peacemaker is used by God to bring shalom, his peace, to a place where it isn't. In our own country, the Civil War ripped this country in half, and not only was it one half of the country against the other, but brothers fought brothers and cousins fought brothers and sometimes killed family members. And after that Civil War was over, there was such hatred and such bitterness in some people it exists to this day. But the North had a desire to come in and subjugate the South. They had won, and they wanted to reduce them to poverty. They wanted to keep them in, in, in the same grip of their vengeance because of what they did to us. And Abraham Lincoln was our president at that time. And he argued for treating people with kindness and with equity and with care. And they said, we want to destroy our enemies. And you know, when we think of destroying your enemy, we think of an epic movie where you go in guns blazing and shoot them all up. But here's his, here's his quote, and I think it totally is the spirit of don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. He said, I destroy my enemies when I make them my friends. That's the way God wants us to destroy our enemies. To say, let's not have this bitterness and this anger and this resentment. Let's not live in that. But be aware of the power of love. That if you will open your heart to God's love and if you will let him fill you, if you will live in the awareness of all that God has forgiven you for, then God begins to give you the power to forgive. And some of you have been hurt deeply. I get that. It may have been like Daisy, repeated hurts as you were growing up. It may have been an ugly and prolonged divorce. It may have been people who victimized you in other ways. And I believe that the message of the scriptures is that God has so much love for you that he wants to set you free from that. And then he wants to have his love come out of you to be a light to the people who are caught in darkness. Remember the first week we said, remember it's not, they're not your enemy, they're victims of the enemy. That if you begin to see Satan's role to steal, to kill and destroy, and he loves to bring divisions in families and divisions in life groups and divisions in churches and divisions between churches. And Satan is the author of steal, kill, destroy. And God is doing the opposite. And you and I are called to be his ambassadors, to bring the power of love to the situations, to bring God's goodness, God's grace, and to not only not be overcome by evil and live in resentment and revenge, but to bring God's hope and peace and love. And I want to ask you that question. Where is it in your life that you need this? Where is it that you get caught in revenge and resist resentment? And where God wants to pour his love into you so that you can pour his love through you. And remember, it's not possible without the spirit of God in you. And for some of you, maybe that's the choice you need to make. You need to say, God, I need your forgiveness. I need your healing. I need you to come and fill my life. 
And if you've never done that, we would love to talk to you about what it means to become a follower of Jesus. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we follow the one who, when he was stretched out on a cross and was nailed to that tree, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And that's what Jesus wants us to do as we follow him. I'm going to hand off to the Green Campus and to South Umpqua as you guys walk through these last couple points. Love you guys. When you're filled with resentment, you throw sparks. And when you throw sparks, fires get started. And years ago, we talked about resentment and bitterness and letting go. And somebody came up to me after that message and they said, you know what? I've been throwing fewer sparks and there are fewer fires. We don't want to admit that we are the source of a lot of our conflicts. But you can't possibly do that unless you've allowed God to heal you inside. Sometimes you need somebody to talk to about that. Sometimes you need more than just a momentary choice. You need a continuing choice of how to forgive and how to let go. And we'd love to help walk you through that process. I don't know who you've been thinking about as you've been listening, but... I encourage you to think specifically. Last week, Pastor Jason talked about writing a letter to someone. And I want you to continue to bore in and say, what, who is it that God wants me to forgive? And it, most of you, there's been somebody on your mind all the time I've been talking. And you need to say, okay, God, by your power and by your spirit, I choose to forgive. There is always a reason not to do it now. It's too soon. I don't feel like it. They don't deserve it. Just set those aside and say, God, by your power, I want to live in hope and in freedom and in love. I don't want to be overcome by evil anymore. I want to overcome evil with good. Father, thank you for the power of the cross. Thank you for the power of your grace. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness when we didn't deserve it. And instead of the punishment that we deserved, instead of the the shame that we lived in. God, you've given us hope and forgiveness and peace. And I pray for everybody who's here that in the middle of our struggling with blaming and rationalizing and holding on to our cactus, that God, you would give us the power to be set free, that by your Spirit you enable us to forgive, you would enable us to let it go, that we could turn it over to you And that you would give us wisdom about whether we can restore that relationship or not. And so, God, we trust you. And we ask that you would help us to be people of radical love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here. And you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around of the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.